everybody. It's Timor and we are back for one more episode of Black at Indie, and it's a very special one because we're going to be talking about code switching. And I have two uh, very distinguished guests here this evening, and we have Dr. Khalid El Hakim. How you doing, brother? I'm doing well, man. I'm honored to be here. Yeah, listen. Uh, now the pleasure is mine, <laughs> and uh, and we have my my good old fraternity brother, Dr. Edmund Ajapong. How are you doing, man? I'm well. I'm well. What's going on? <laughs> Just uh, taking it one day at a time, man. Yeah, taking it one at a time. That college life is definitely something interesting. So, definitely enjoying it. Uh, all in all, so yeah, we're going to just uh, jump into it. So, uh, actually, let me ask. So, Doctor Khalid El Hakim, what what is the short the abbreviation? So, Doctor Khalid, Doctor El Hakim, uh, Doctor Khalid. That's it. Okay. Khalid is fine. Doctor Khalid. Okay, there we go. Okay, so can you tell our listeners? Because I've been doing some research too. We want to talk about a recent <clears throat> interview. What is uh, the Black History One on One Mobile Museum? Yeah, so um, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum is a collection of original artifacts, about 10,000 artifacts that date from the transatlantic slave trade up to hip hop culture. It's a project that I started um, in 1995 after returning from the Million Man March. And oh. uh, prior, to the, prior to the Million Man March, it was just um, a private collection that I had, uh, just shared with my friends, family. Uh, but I was inspired to start collecting from, um, after taking an intro to sociology course with Dr. David Pilgrim of Ferris State University, who started the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia. So he had a very, uh, very unique way of introducing uh, the, the idea of the origins of racism in his class. Every week he would bring in a different artifact into the classroom and, and engage us in having some uh, deep conversations, uncomfortable, uncomfortable conversations for some people, but uh, for, for for um, someone like me, it was just an affirmation of um, understanding, you know, what racism racism is. You know, sometimes we experience racism and we're not able to put our finger on what it is, but then to see evidence of it in a tangible way, it just is just a deep affirmation. So after taking his class, I started collecting uh, material. I eventually became a social studies teacher in the Detroit Public Schools. I taught middle school for about 15 years. Um, in in, uh, in Detroit, and then I found myself using those same type of artifacts in the classroom to teach. And then, like I said, I went to the Million Man March, and what what was once a private collection became a public collection. I uh, came back home uh, to Detroit and started doing uh, uh, public exhibits and small grassroots uh, meetings around Detroit. And uh, the word kind of spread about the uh, impact of this collection and in some of the material I had. And people started making comparisons between me and, and uh, Dr. Charles Wright, who was mm-hmm. one of the pioneering um, Black museum uh, founders, um, along with uh, Margaret Burroughs and many other people. Um, so I just started doing exhibits around town. And eventually, I started getting invited to college campuses and the churches and you know public libraries and so forth and so on. And um, it just grew from there. Uh, in 2011, I decided to leave uh, the Detroit Public Schools to do this full time. That was 10, you know, just about 10 years ago now. Um, and um, I've been traveling around the country ever since then. Um, I went back to school, went to grad school. I uh, got my master's degree from West, uh, Western Michigan University. And last year, well, earlier, earlier this year, I received my PhD from the University of Illinois. With the museum, I work with a lot of hip hop artists too. Uh, Professor Griff is, is very much a part of the Black History 101 Mobile Museum. He travels uh, most places with me. And at this point, uh, the museum has been to 40 states and over 500 institutions, man. So we've been putting man. some work in. Yeah. Y'all ain't came to Notre Dame yet? We have not been to Notre Dame okay. yet. Yeah, well, I actually, when I, when I was managing, um, whew, I was managing uh, a poet by the name of Jamal May Versus. Uh, and we came to Notre Dame when I was working with him. But yeah, I, I haven't had a, the museum there yet. Yeah. yeah, but that, but that's yeah, that's that's it. Okay. That's it in a nutshell, brother. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, we're yeah. gonna get something started uh-huh. then. <laughs> now, I love that. All right, Fred. What about you, man? So tell us where where are you located? Um, I'm in the Bronx. I'm in the Bronx, New York. Uh, born and raised, and you know, it's, it's a beautiful place to stay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Always, I'm from New York City. Always, always repping the Bronx and the, and the East Coast. And Listen, you got something special going on too. So first of all, we'll we'll do this in two parts. So you teach where? I teach at Seton Hall in New Jersey. Okay. And yeah. what exactly do you teach? So I'm a teacher educator. So um, 
I'm a, my title, my line is a STEM educator. So I, I focus on teaching science education courses. Um, I have my own course. I, I created my own course called, um, uh, what is the course called? Urban, uh, Urban Education Through the Concept of Hip Hop. It's, it's my, one of my favorite courses. I call it, it's my hip hop class. Um, but I created a hip hop class where we can, um, where myself and my students, we, we talk and discuss and, and find the intersections of hip hop and education and how to implement that in the classroom with young, with young kids in K, K-12 spaces. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting. So I, um, so, so Dr. Khalid, I met him, uh, what, this is, what year is this? This is 2020, uh, in 2018, maybe? Like two years ago, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Golly, man. Uh, and so it was at the African-American, African-American, uh, higher education conference. I can't even think what the B stands for. Yeah, yeah. But, um, and so I, he was, he had a class where we were discussing like, you know, as far as hip hop and then I also discussed like hip hop based education something I never heard of before. And I was, I was, I was already drawn into it because one, it's, it's what I love, but two, it's so different because where I come from, we never had anything like that. And because you're so close to the source, like you are in the area where hip hop was birthed. I was like, okay, I said, he, I said, he know what he's talking about. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but you know what, man? So can you tell us a little bit about what is it that hip hop, hip hop based education does? How did it begin? Who started all of that good stuff? Yeah, man. Um, hip hop based education, it's um it's been in existence for I would say like a, a few decades, and maybe like about two decades. But it started off like slowly with more like hip hop studies stuff, you know, um, and just like, you know, scholars exploring hip hop, you know, uh like just trying to make sense of hip hop and, and bring like bringing hip hop into academic spaces. When we talk more so like specifically on hip hop based education and folks incorporating hip hop into schools, I would say like, you know, Dr. Morell um at at Notre Dame, uh, Ernest Morell at Notre Dame was kind of one of the pioneers. Um, I, Andrea Duncan, a lot of folks, Chris Emden has pioneered some of this work. Uh, Glory Lasting Billings, a lot of OGs in the sense have, yeah. have pioneered and um, have, have, have provided some intellectual heft to the field and to this work. Um, but what hip hop based education is essentially is like, we're just exploring the ways that we can incorporate hip hop into educational spaces. Yeah. Um, K-12 spaces, also higher ed spaces. And the field is still small, but growing to the sense where you have folks, like I focus on science and education, but you have folks who are like really breaking up into like specializing into different content areas. I have, you know, I know somebody who's out in um, Michigan, Kelly Allen is focusing on how to incorporate hip hop into social studies classrooms. I know folks, you know, Ian Levy talks about hip, incorporating hip hop into counseling spaces, you know. So the, the, the movement is growing in terms of like, how do we focus and train people? Like, how do we really focus and support teachers, counselors, educators writ large on making these cultural connections? But then we also gotta be super careful, right? And thoughtful as to how we do it. It's not just about like, yo, hip hop, yeah. and let's just be hip hop, right? Yeah. Hippity hoppity, right? Yeah. But like really being authentic and um and thoughtful as to how we incorporate hip-hop into educational spaces yeah and you're right uh, and actually i'm going to ask this question for the both of you so with what you both do how can you well first actually i'm, I'm asking you real quick Fred. so is this program specifically geared towards the inner city schools can this be done like at you know predominantly white high schools or middle schools or colleges yeah. what is your take on that yeah man so for me i i make so hip-hop education arguably it, it's, thought, it's thought of as a form of culture responsive teaching. And when people hear culture responsive education and culture responsive teaching, they think black and brown folks, right? Yeah. But Gloria Langston Billings kind of pioneered that work and she was the first one to tell you that culture responsive education is for everyone, mm -hmm. right? So I, I argue hip hop education is in the same vein as for everyone, right? It might've been created with a certain group in mind, right? Mm -hmm. Black and brown folks, inner city youth who have more cultural connections to hip hop. But then we take a step back when we think about pedagogy and the art of teaching, number one, everybody kind of needs a fair shake at things. But then also I make the argument that when we think about the number one consumer of hip hop music and culture, mm -hmm. it's not black folk, right? It's white folks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always make the argument that hip hop is the most consumed genre of the world, right? And not, I, I recognize that not every person has a direct connection to hip hop culture or might yeah. feel like they identify as part of hip hop culture. Yeah. But almost everyone participates in hip hop culture in some way, shape, or form, right? Whether it's consciously or subconsciously. So I definitely argue that the, the culture as an art form um, can definitely be incorporated into all educational spaces to support all students around teaching and learning. But then it also provides um, a, a bridge for those who who may not be aware of the culture of hip hop and you know the folks who participate and engage in that culture, who create that culture. So it's a great avenue to really talk about the experiences, um, the perceptions, the perspectives 
of black and brown folks, particularly in inner cities as well. Yeah, and and so you use hip hop, a predominant a, a, a black genre, to teach science, technology, engineering, and math. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's cool. That's cool. So, and so, so Dr. Khalid, you, I watched your recent, um, the the recent interview. I'm sorry, the recent presentation you did in August. I'm not mistaken, August uh, of this yeah. year. Pretty yeah. interesting. I I uh I was shocked by a lot, and I, I wrote down a couple of things I want to talk to you. I want you to sort of you know share with us about one the little rascals. Um, yeah. <laughs> I watched that, and I, the whole time I, if, if I, <laughs> of course, you know, they, the women say they'll clutch their pearls. I was like flabbergasted, man. I never would have thought the little rascals would have something like that. So, can you can you explain that whole scenario? Yeah. So, um, well, let, let me let me put it like this, and just put it into a hip hop context as, as, as well. So, what I found um, in terms of the genius of the culture is the many ways that hip hop has responded to white racism and white supremacy. And so to be able to use hip hop and show examples of hip hop, how hip hop has responded over the years to either slavery, Jim Crow, um, you know, the prison industrial complex, whatever it might be, hip hop has responded to it at some point in some time, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I used to show clips of the little rascals to my students in middle school. And the first time I showed it, I was doing it in a very innocent way, just kind of showing my mm -hmm. students right. how we, um, you know, things I found found funny, right? But at that point, I hadn't watched The Little Rascal since I was a kid. Right. So I didn't have the adult point of view. So I showed them this clip, and uh, well, I showed them a full episode, but it gets to a point where The Little Rascals are going through this cave and Lil Buckwheat is on outside the cave and they want they don't want to get lost in this cave. So what they do is they tie a rope around Buckwheat and you know, use that as a, as a way to keep them from getting lost in the cave. But what they do, instead of tying the rope around his waist, they tie it around his neck, mm -hmm. all right? And they go so far into the cave, at one point, I think uh, uh, Spanky or one, one of the kids asked, you know, who's on the other end of this rope? And you know somebody goes, oh, it's a little buckwheat, and they pull it, and buckwheat falls into a hole. Mm -hmm. So this is happening in you know the early '30s, late '20s when this comes out, and this is being shown through um, through theaters throughout the country, and everybody loves the little rascals. But right. in that, you're getting um, some ideas of the beliefs and the thoughts and the attitudes of people during that time. So this is at the height of lynching in America. Yep. We know in 1930. You know, it's a very famous um, uh, lynching that happened in, in um, Marion, Indiana, right? Mm -hmm. And you have two brothers who were hung, and uh, uh, that hanging inspires, you know, um, Billy Holiday to sing Strange Fruit, right? Yeah. So, um, but that, that's what that, that's in response to so that. That's why I, I brought up in that, that presentation, just giving people a sense of how something can be seen as innocent as the Little Rascals, but at the same time, it's very much up in your face, you know, if you're an adult and you have a sense of history, yeah. you see exactly what that is. And it, it, it's so interesting because you see all of these, you know, adults, uh, and I'll say that those kids grew up and who knows yeah. where those kids are now? Who knows what their thought pattern may be? Um, right. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's sad because it even makes me think about, you know, what we have on TV now. And I don't know all the shows that are on TV. Uh, I still like the Jets and I like the Flintstones, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I mean, I like Cousin Skeeter as well, too. But I, I don't know, would you, either of you know of any shows that we have now that have messages like that that we just aren't paying attention to? I've seen a couple of shows over the past 10 years or so um, watching TV with my daughter. And some things pop up. Yeah, you, you, you'll see some things pop up. Mm -hmm. There was one girl's show um, probably about seven or eight years ago I saw... Um, the, they they're talking about little girl's hair, and this this girl um, had straight hair at one point. And then all of a sudden, you know, some water got on her hair, and it became a big afro, and she just started crying. Oh, and, is, that, uh, is that a cartoon? Wait, there's a the movie, like a hair movie. It what it, it no, this this was a cartoon. Okay, okay, but um, yeah, yeah, but this this was a cartoon. But I mean, it was just obvious that that it dealt with that that you know that that stereotypical imagery of how black girls should look. And if you, if you don't have straight hair, you know what that means. But 
Yeah, man. But I find using this type of material to engage in these conversations is a way to open that door. And you know, another thing too, uh, you know, that I saw in his presentation was uh, the Adidas. I know black people love Jordans. People love shoes in general, but for Adidas to, to do that, can uh, just explain, how did you even find that? So that, um, I'm trying to remember where I got that image from. It might've come from Professor Griff, one of his lectures. Okay. But the shoes are, a, a concept shoe that they had that almost came to the market with uh, shackles at the bottom of it. They were high tops and they had shackles at the bottom of it. And, um, you know, and you have to ask yourself the question, who's sitting at these tables making these decisions and bringing a concept to the table like that? Yeah. And, and you know, just it was just last year. Um, was it last year or earlier this year, uh, Colin Kaepernick had to have a conversation with Nike about the Betsy Ross yeah. uh, Nike that they were trying to put out. And remind them that, you know, that flag that Betsy Ross made time that we were still enslaved. And the thing is, is that they were trying to sell those shoes to the hip hop generation. So if you don't have a sense of your history, then, you know, here's another example of us being disrespected when it comes to, you know, corporations, fashion. Being that, you know, you're, you're teaching these kids, um, you know, you're using hip hop to teach them. Do, and actually I'll throw this question, either of you. Are there any cases where you've run into cultural appropriation in the line of work that you do? And if so, like, how do you how do you handle that? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's it's easy to appropriate hip hop culture, right? And I think for me, when when working with educators and engaging with hip hop work, I, I always recognize that educators, particularly white educators, are very timid in like coming to this work, and I and I can understand why, right? Because um, you know, I think folks don't they, they necessarily they don't they, they don't want to well some folks don't want to appropriate right and some might just do it intentionally or whatever the case may be but you know if you run into appropriation oftentimes in my experience it's from folks who just are inexperienced and lack like, the knowledge right yeah. but when it comes to the hip hop work what I try to do with teachers and educators is like say like you know listen if you're an educator and you want to engage in cyber work but you don't feel like you have like a hundred percent like the grounding. Um, and understand the history of it and the culture, you know, number one, do some reading, right? Because you have to learn on your own. Yep. But number two, like if your students in the classroom identify as part of that culture, it's a great opportunity to leverage their voices and their power within the space, yep. right? And have them say like, and, and, and as an educator, the person who has the most power in that classroom space, you know, you now become the learner and have the students kind of teach you about their culture. And that allows you as an educator to get an authentic representation of the culture, right? Because yep. I'm from New York. Hip hop looks, sounds, and feels a little different than it does in Atlanta, than it does in yeah, Miami, yeah, That's, yeah. you know, in, in different geographical locations. So it's important for us to take account of that, right? And even myself as an educator, you know, even when I when I came when I had the idea of like you know utilizing hip hop in my classroom, it backfired on me initially because the hip hop and the way I connect to hip hop was different than the way my young people connect to hip hop. So I had to realize that and recognize that. I'm like, yo, you know, this Jay-Z song is coming out. Like, let's talk about it. Like, who the, like who's Jay-Z and who's checking him out, right? So it's important to understand like what parts of the culture your young people value also while allowing them to, allow, while teaching them other parts of the culture as well so they can consume and be critical about it, right? So it is about utilizing hip hop in the classroom. It's about utilizing hip hop as a tool to engage and increase interest in classes, but it's also a way to like to, to share and teach black history, right? Which is also a hip hop history. I was teaching, I'm in, in my hip hop class this semester, I had a black student say like, wow, this is the first time I've learned about black history from a positive lens, right? You know, yeah. the, those yeah. stories and those narratives are, are important. And while like, you know, I, I can make a bunch of arguments about hip -hop, why hip hop is, it can be utilized as, a, as, a, as an effective approach to teaching, but then also it's, it's just, it's culture, right? And it's a culture that that has been marginalized, that represents groups of people who have been pushed into marginalized society. Yeah. So allowing it within academic spaces that are historically and traditionally Eurocentric um, and that value, very white values and Eurocentric values, it, it, it tells the, the community and the students something like, you know, we're here to listen, we're here, like it's an actionable step yeah. to say like, we, we see you and we want to bring more of you into this space. And, and this, this might be one way of doing it. And what about you, Dr. Khalid? Uh, any cases, I know, because you are, you're out there teaching you know, with the Black History you know, one on one Mobile Museum. Have you run into any instances, even as you were teaching in the classrooms with this? I'm trying to think of any particular, not really. I've had, I've had people reach out to me um, 
recently somebody reached out to me with uh they had a a girl in that class a, a teenager who was just you know a white female te- uh white female student who really wanted to get dreadlocks and mm-hmm. you know wanted to do it because it was a you know fashionable but just did not have a, a sense of what the the history of that meant right yeah. so uh you know and, and you're going you have that and um be, you know before telling somebody not to, you know, you use that as a, a, just a teaching opportunity, just, just to give them information. Yeah. And then, you know, once, once you give people information, then they can make a decision based mm-hmm. upon that. And knowing that, you know, you might find yourself in a situation where you have to uh, uh, respond or, you know, uh, have a conversation with someone that you might offend, yeah. you know, doing that. So, um, you know, I, uh, um, Cardi B just had to, you know, deal with an issue recently I saw by wearing that. a dress, you know, uh, that, that was from Hindu culture. But she had to apologize. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it goes across the board. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. So um, uh, we, we, we have to be conscious. And sometimes, even though the most conscious and woke of us uh, have mm-hmm. blind spots that we have to deal with. You know what I'm we saying? We all got them. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. Sure. And the good thing about it is that, I mean, the only one, the only good thing that can come from, I, I would assume, is that the, the positive conversations that come from, you know, oh, like you're, you know, coming from the appropriation piece, right? So yeah. if you're appropriating something, it, it provides the opportunity to have a conversation as to why is that appropriation? How is that offending somebody yeah. from that, from that, from those, from that culture and that value? Yeah. And then it, it, hopefully we, we can learn and, and not make those mistakes again. Oh, it was just getting so good. But listen, it's okay, because next week we'll be airing part two. And before you leave, make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel below because we don't want you to miss anything. Okay, see you next week.